Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series. Firstly, as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Palawa people and custodians of the land upon which we meet and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Dr. Karen Butler Henderson and I'm the Associate Professor of Digital Health in the College of Health and Medicine here at the University. It is with great pleasure that I'm your MC for this afternoon as we hear from three leading international experts in digital health. The Islands of Idea program is a program designed to keep the ideas flowing during this period when we're unable to host live public events. Each year, the University presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars and workshops free of charge for our students, alumni and the wider community. There is an important part of the university's role and this is why we are hosting forums such as this one this afternoon. Just a few housekeeping notes before today's forum gets underway. Your microphone, camera, chat function and raise hand function have all been disabled so our speakers are not interrupted. But we do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A function you'll see on your screen. A selection of these questions will be answered during the Q&A section towards the end of this forum. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access on our YouTube and SoundCloud channels. Today's forum is very timely. This week we've been celebrating women in information technology. And today we'll be hearing from not one, but two amazing women who've been leading in national leadership roles in digital health in Australia, and from a global expert in digital health. And on that note, please allow me to introduce our first speaker. Professor Meredith Maycam is the Associate Dean for Community and Primary Health Care with the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney, where she is responsible for developing community and primary health care strategy. Her academic interests include patient safety in primary care and aged care, and she received awards recognising her research into medication discrepancies between residential aged care facilities and general practice digital health systems. She is a general practitioner in Sydney and a former recipient of the College Medal for the College Medal of the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. She has strong interest in the application of Australia's national digital health infrastructure, including the My Health Record and other systems that promote better connected care and empowering people with access to their own health information. Thank you, Meredith, for joining us this afternoon. There we go. Thank you very much. So, um, well, thank you to Karen and the organisers of today's session, and also to my co-presenters. It's a great privilege to uh, share this session with you, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this subject also. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm the Associate Dean at the University of Sydney. I'm also a practising GP at MQ Health in the north of Sydney. And I've previously worked in advisory roles for government, uh, including the Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. And I was the former Chief Medical Advisor for the Australian Digital Health Agency until July of this year. I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you in person in Tasmania today. Uh, I have very fond memories of visiting quite a number of your healthcare services and providers to talk about digital health in recent years. Uh, in particular, I was blown away by the electronic health record and other digital health innovations that Dr. Jeff Ayton uh, showed me, which had been developed in-house by the Australian Antarctic Division in Hobart. And the telehealth innovation that you pioneered in Tasmania over the years has now been widely deployed around Australia to support our COVID-19 response. The silver lining, if we could argue that there is one for COVID-19, is that it's been a lightning rod for health system reform and digital health. 
And we've seen new services quickly develop with a massive increase in the use of telehealth to deliver care and acceleration in the electronic prescribing system, as well as a big jump in my health record used by people. But where I want to begin with you today is to talk about why we should really care about electronic health records and be thinking about ways to improve these systems. I have a research background in patient safety and a passion for giving people and their clinicians better access to health information. And I believe that the most important reason that our electronic health record systems need to continue to evolve and support the reform of our health system is so that we cause less avoidable harm to people who encounter healthcare in Australia. The key point I wanna to make today is that high quality electronic health records that are able to be meaningfully shared by everyone can prevent avoidable mistakes that result in serious patient harm and death. And when I say everyone, I really mean everyone. That is not only should we be fully sharing our records between all parts of primary care and our hospital systems, but we should also be allowing our patients full access to their own health information in these systems. Now, this is a newspaper clipping from the case a couple of years ago that you may recall of a man who tragically died alone in a country Australian motel with a potentially avoidable complication of his chemotherapy. And due to the continued reliance on fax machines by our health system, and please ref reflect that uh, healthcare is the last bastion of this outdated technology, uh, his CT results were simply faxed by the hospital to a wrong number and nobody followed up. The coroner found that this event directly contributed to his death. And our coroner's courts and, and our medico legal insurance databases are sadly littered with examples like this, which demonstrate our siloed and poorly connected health system. So think about this case today as you're listening to our talks, because there are lots of factors that contribute to this situation. One of which, of course, is, is the functionality that's currently lacking from um, electronic health record systems in terms of interoperability between primary care-based and hospital-based electronic health record systems and the visibility of health information to people like Mr Hawala. And while those electronic health records continue to live in different and disconnected universes, we'll continue to struggle to avoid simple mistakes that can seriously harm people. And these aren't new stories. Um, back in 2001, when I was an academic GP registrar at the University of Sydney, where I, I began my academic career with Professor Michael Kidd, we ran the Australian arm of the first international pilot study comparing reported errors in primary care amongst seven countries, and then the subsequent threats to Australian patient safety study. And our method for these studies was that we asked GPs to report any errors they observed in practice using a secure online platform. And then we analyzed them to describe what they were and their contributing factors. And we built a taxonomy for error in Australian general practice, which uh, was later published and, and has subsequently been translated and used internationally. And we found that it was systems related errors almost twice as often as a deficiency in a clinician's knowledge and skills that contributed to errors for people encountering our health system. And we also found that around 20% of the errors that were reported by GPs were directly correct connected to medical record issues. Uh, not exclusively electronic health records, but more often than not back then between 2003 and 2006, when these reports were gathered, GPs were using a digital clinical information system for their notes in general practice, but some were using a mixture of both handwritten and electronic medical records, which in itself was a source of error. Now, fast forward to today, to 2020, and the number of general practices who are currently using a digital clinical information system is estimated to be probably around 98%, with almost all GPs now using an electronic system for prescribing. And the latest RACGP Health of the Nation report estimates that 87% of practices are now, in fact, fully digital with their electronic health records and maintain no paper records at all. So a, a quick look back in time, where did electronic records begin? In fact, the origins of electronic health records in the general practice setting 
began back in 1993. And this was supported by various incentives for GPs to computerise in the 90s. And so we actually saw a more developed use of electronic health records in our primary care system in Australia than our hospital systems at an earlier point in time. And I know my co-presenters have a lot of knowledge on the current use of electronic health records in the, whole, in the hospital sector and we'll expand on that. But here you can also see on the timeline the development of my health record, uh, which is a personal health record, meaning people can view their own health information and control aspects of the record. Now, most people listening out there are probably quite familiar by now with My Health Record, but I want to touch on this briefly and discuss its role in Australia's electronic health record reform journey. Um, and, and I still meet quite a number of uh, GP colleagues and other clinicians particularly, and certainly patients as well, who aren't quite familiar with all of the content of My Health Record and, and the, the actual uh, utility of the system, what it can do for you. Um, but it's, essentially it's a secure online summary of your health information. And any securely connected healthcare provider that you see can deposit bits of information in there. And you can choose to control what's in there and which healthcare providers can can see it. But the basic idea is that all of the healthcare providers who are looking after you will be able to see and share clinical information to help us make safer clinical decisions. And most importantly, you can access it yourself and be empowered by that information and able to better participate in your own health and care. And we're amongst a small group of countries who have enabled citizen access to their health information in this way. And while our national digital infrastructure and My Health Record will play a big role in enabling communication and healthcare reform in Australia, and should also help us avoid harming people in our health system, uh, there are things that it's not able to do. And we need to acknowledge that the broader system reform of our electronic health records is still required. My Health Record is not designed to replace electronic health records and it doesn't offer a person a way to interact with their full electronic health record information. Now, some portal systems offer help for people here and that's happening in Australia in, in some places, not many, but there, there's also a growing body of international evidence supporting the use of systems like this one, which is called Open Notes. Um, this is a system that was uh, that originated in the US and provides people with the ability to look at their full record and read their healthcare provider's notes after consultations, as well as access all of their results and other information in their record. Um, this is a slide showing the results of a trial of open notes at Toronto's Princess Margaret Cancer Hospital Research Centre, uh, which was presented at an open note seminar just last week. And here, um, people have immediate access to their results and all of their notes. And it was found that the system after a year had greatly improved a range of healthcare indicators and both patient and clinician satisfaction. The blue bubbles at the bottom are clinicians, the, the orange ones at the top are patients. Um, it's quite common, however, where, wherever these types of things are introduced, and we did see this with My Health Record as well, that doctors in particular are very concerned about the issue that patient access will be detrimental in some way for themselves or their patients. But it's been shown over and over again in open notes evaluations that the clinicians go from being extremely concerned and negative to very enthusiastic and able to see the benefits of these sorts of systems for everyone. And I wanted to show you this quote as well. This is a quote from a patient in the Canadian evaluation, and it's making an incredibly important point. While we argue and, and quite rightly are concerned that people might be unduly upset by a test result if they see it before their doctor explains it to them, the reality that I think we need to come to terms with, and I don't think everyone in Australia has yet, uh, with as electronic health records evolve, is that people have the right to decide themselves if they want to see their own health information. Doctors and other clinicians in Canada, and this is also the case in Australia and a small number of other countries, do not actually have the legal right to block people from seeing any aspects of their own health information that they wish to see. The international evidence of actual harm resulting from a, a, a scenario where a person sees a concerning result in their electronic health record before their healthcare provider explains it to them is incredibly rare. But the very common situation we have now is that people don't have access to their electronic health records or their results. 
And in unfortunate cases where their results don't get followed up by mistake, we see patient safety incidents occurring, and this failure to follow up is a regularly recognised cause of incidents that result in serious harm and death. And this is an article from some leading Australian digital health researchers, which highlighted that some systematic reviews have estimated that between 20 and 60% of test results in hospital systems are never followed up. Now, another challenge that our current electronic health record systems are not meeting is the issue of incorrect or inconsistent information being held for people in various clinical records in different parts of the siloed healthcare system that we have. And without interoperability or the ability to seamlessly and meaningfully share information, we're left with situations where a failure of electronic health record systems to connect with each other and update clinical information and medicine changes in real time creates a potential source of serious harm for people. This is the Grace Med study paper, which was recently published in the International Journal of Medical Informatics. And we found that 95% of residents in aged care facilities had different medications recorded on their medication charts at the facility where they lived, compared with the medications listed at the same moment in time in the electronic health record of their GP back at the practice. And this leads to the problem that as a GP in that situation, I can't safely share information about that resident with another provider or another health record system from my practice system. And I can't prescribe that person a new medicine using my practice clinical information systems decision support tools that check for interactions and allergies because I have the wrong medicines entered into my practice electronic health record. I'm unable to effectively use that decision support tool in the electronic health record at my practice for my residential aged care facility patients. So uh, I'm just conscious of time and I want to finish up here and think about where does that actually leave us with the future of electronic health records? What do we really want and need our future electronic health records to actually be able to do? And I've offered you here my top wish list for the future and it was longer, but I, I thought this was a good start. And I think we're definitely approaching some of these things in some of our electronic health record systems but there's still great variation out there. And that leads to health inequities and threats to patient safety for people. And I want my future electronic health record to be safe, accessible, easy to use and intelligent. I want it to keep evolving uh, to meet my needs and the needs of our society if we, as we face crises like COVID-19. And I want all Australians to have access to it and benefit from it. So continually improving our electronic health records is a critical part of achieving health system reform and delivering better, safer care to people. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much, Meredith. Our next speaker is Dr. Monica Trujillo, who is a Senior Director, Clinical Medical Officer and Chief Clinical Information Officer for CERNA Australia and Asia Pacific. She leads CERNA's highly skilled team of clinicians to raise clinical leadership strategy and engagement across 400 plus Asia Pacific hospitals and community health center lines. Prior to her role with CERNA, Monica was the inaugural Chief Clinical Information Officer at the Australian Digital Health Agency, responsible for clinical consumer engagement and clinical governance. She was Australia's first Chief Medical Information Officer and under her leadership, St. Stephen's Hospital became the first fully integrated digital hospital in Australia. She is well known for her to advocate for clinical and consumer leadership and engagement to achieve better health outcomes. Thank you, Monica, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hello from uh, beautiful Queensland, where I'm trying to control the big sunshine that's coming through the window. So I make sure that the light's not too bright. Um, so thank you, Meredith, and thank you uh, to the University of Tasmania for having me today. I think Meredith has highlighted a, a very important aspect, and that is the need, the actual need for um, the electronic health systems and the implications for these in safety and quality as well. And listening to the journey in primary care, it really um, hits home, and I'll take that wish list from you, Meredith, as well, um, 
to be able to talk a little bit about what um, I have seen, um, what is currently real and what um, I foresee as the development of electronic health records in itself. So let me start a little bit with the um, electronic health journey from the, and from the evolution as well from what Meredith you're talking about in primary health, but as well from what was a traditional record keeper of processes and tasks, it really has moved to be a connector across all the different um, areas of care provider as such. So most recently, the most important key piece of the puzzle that has been missing has been added, and that is actually the patients, the carers, the consumers and their families themselves to this whole journey of electronic health records have to share a personal experience. And that is um, my sister recently had major abdominal surgery in the US and um, given our travel restrictions, the plan was always for me to be there um, as the only medical practitioner in the family, but I couldn't. But she has access to her patient portal and gave me access to the patient portal, which actually was active during her admission. And I was able to actively follow her through her admission and follow her temperature peak, talk to her provider. She, we worked at a plan and do all that while she was in actual Washington, D.C. and I was in Australia. So that's what we have enabled at the point in time here and now. Adding to that, the development really of now all the mobile platforms and what we have seen now is the development of a, the influx and the growth of data itself. And then all the architectures really developed to deliver that better experience and to, to move across those different platforms and the operating systems that are developed to increase the convenience really to the users. And surrounding that, what we've seen really is an innovation um, ecosystem that targets those consumers of the electronic health records, be it clinicians or being patients and their families. So part of the journey has really been the use and the insights that can come out of that massive amounts of, of data in itself. And I call that, and, and um, we see that through the data value chain as such. So focusing on how we manage the policies surrounding governance, surrounding all the data, it really has required a whole new set of social paradigms um, across all industries that really seem to force us to sort of uh, catch up to what was to match the social expectations. We have seen, for example, elections turned and overturned and moved around with the use of data and such because the aggregation of the data is really only useful if it is within the context of those that need to gather intelligence from it and what is being construed as such with data and information. So what we've seen is large data sets really aggregated to either run the machine-based learning algorithms, and we've seen that on one side, but also support the research area. So large data aggregation, when we, as we move to cloud-based platforms to support um, research done on large amounts of data, and we've seen that with COVID, but also to go back to what Meredith was talking about and is that consumer engagement to actually not only use the data, but give intelligence back to the consumer in a way that is um, digestible and to influence some of those behavioral changes that will support them in their wellness journey. And then again, to support the health services in operations management as such. So we see the creations of dashboards of contextually aware data that's able to assist whether I'm a nurse manager, whether I'm a health service planner, whether I am a consumer of a particular, um, I need to plan for my staffing or whether I need to actually see what models of care or something as an emergency department as such. So we've seen the digitization of healthcare um, and we have focused on what I would call, you know, that right side of, of the screen as such. So it's an essential part of what we do and it's absolutely necessary, but digitizing um, through that right side, which is the points of care like pharmacies, GPs and primary cares that we heard from Meredith, hospitals, community and mental health and long-term only affects one side of where a person actually is and it makes us more efficient at way all ways of working as such so once we digitize what we have is an opportunity really to create 
new ways of working and find new care models that actually involve the rest of what you can see on the screen. So a person does not only move through the health areas, but also, you know, employers, education areas, fitness areas, you know, the particular areas of faith and any other social care services as well. And then taking into context those market pressures that are around, but also what are the objectives of what we're trying to achieve, really bringing it into one. So taking that person in the health journey as a whole, not as just the bits and elements of health in itself. So years of efforts to digitise and for, you know, my colleagues, I know you have been working on this for a lot of years, really a lot of years of effort brought us to um, really accelerate a lot of what we've been working on in the last year due to the pandemic, really. And so what we moved what to include quickly those elements that we had scattered around and, and, and considered innovations to what is day to day practice. So looking at um, creating that longitudinal care record, so not record of just my episode of care as such, but across all venues, but then creating a personalised plan to support that care record as well. And that is based on intelligence and analytics that, come, that comes from all the other areas as such. That again is supporting that one digital front door to our consumers, to our patients, to our carers or families, and then deciding on what is on offer. Again, based that on whether we go with the traditional models of care of you know, the acute primary and through the continuum of care, or whether we go to those new models of care and, and support that through virtual care. So either it's the virtual clinics or move through a remote monitoring or continuity of care or clinical pathways that support one or the other. And we can't really be all things for all people and particularly of health, we know we've got a limited amount of resources and that I'm talking about people in itself. So what we need to, uh, to do is harness that power of all the intelligence that is coming out of the record to allow us to segment and, and really risk stratify what we are into cohorts, what we're going to focus on and allow for some of our consumer groups to support them in their self-management, in their journeys, in the goals of care, but really assessing for risk and being able to assess um, and manage with the right models of care, the right people, while we still continue to evolve and make sure that we're looking towards adequate plans of care. So I've heard of, for example, um, primary care rounds that start with looking at what are the people at most at risk in their communities at that point in time due to the data feeds and the intelligence given to them and actually focusing on those that are most at care for some traditional models of care and allowing for those other segments to self-manage or to grow through other pathways and virtual clinics in itself. So going back to COVID and what we've seen this year, we saw, as mentioned before, we saw, I saw a complete acceleration on um, virtual models of care, new, um, new approaches to different strategies and different risk uh, uh, management approaches as well. But what we saw as well this year is really was a call for a new type of EHR um, across all the um, venues of care and in all the journey, a lot, a lot of supporting our patients in their journey for care and for wellness as well. So moving away from that transactional only aspect of what the EHRs have been to really a whole of holistic approach as such. So what, what that really looks like, we look like a personal care plans that are really there for health, moving away from a personal care plan that is just to support a disease, but for health supported by health and care networks that work together to support that, but then so again enabled by that data value chain that is able to get data and translate it to something meaningful, depending on the context as well of where you are. So really look, what does that mean in terms of an EHR? Going back to the, to the, to the concept of an electronic patient record, electronic health record, electronic medical record, or as such, a record in itself, creating those context 
you know, library care plans that are context-based. So the patients that have cardiac heart failure for, that are managing well or that are not managing well or that are have self-management plans or for some particular areas actually need a different type of care plan, being able to access that at different stages of their wellness journey as such as well. That enabled by a care team that supports different risk groups for different outcomes, but moves across all the different care settings as well, the different geographies, but different EHRs as well, and makes that back to that personal and relevant decision support. So one of the things that we've seen coming out of that data value chain is enormous amounts of information. And with the ability to process that with on the cloud now with large volumes of data, we can move to that personal and relevant um, decision support as such. In able to do that, we do have to talk about a couple of foundational pieces. And the first and foremost, really, as you see on the bottom, is that system of record, which we're talking about electronic health record. But we really need to do that um, with a second foundational step, which is that community connectedness. So moving back to what I was talking about, that not just the health and, um, but also looking at what other aspects of the community we can bring into the network to support that and create into a data value chain. But none of that will be able to be, you know, delivering any results unless we have a, a really good support in our transformation pieces. And that is enabled by that record that grows across all areas of, and all venues of the network in itself. And none of that will be able to be achieved if we don't focus on data quality as such as well. So having a, a and I know this could be a whole other talk, but having that focus on data architecture and unified data and terminology that enables that journey as a foundational piece to actually deliver some meaningful intelligence that goes across all the different care settings, geographies, and really follows their patient through their journey of wellness and um, care plan as such. One moment. That was Siri. So what Something is went wrong. Please try again. That's too personalised. So if we move across as well, if we look at what I was talking about, the, 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 you see that the healthcare system moving to outcome space and less focus on service or individual treatment base. The emphasis really must be su supporting that transition from clinical transaction to supporting the person's plan for health as stuff. And what does this mean? That the care is focused on the patient and is family-centered, that our patients can access the records as close to home as possible, but they're responsive and they're integrated and they're also culturally safe and competent in supporting the care team in itself. That is, in ICT, really better supports the performance of the system across from a person to a local community, to a place, to the actual system, but actually that's supported by an engaged, empowered and healthy community that is really focused on partnerships to support that integration and advance the care as well. So when I'm talking about the networks, we're trying to focus too much on putting everything in one, which really what I focus in and what our electronic health records are moving towards being a foundational piece, really to support that person in the community move through all the different venues of care and the non-care into the wellness journey as well. So what does that mean in terms of the EHRs and what we need to do? It really needs, we're really talking about expanding the health network capabilities as well. So going from that person base, really looking at those patient level journeys to understand where the journey is and tailor again, going back to my comment of um, personalised healthcare plans that are in context, what is needed at that point in time and what needs to be redesigned. But then moving to a local community, what are the social risk drivers within that selected population cohort that is driven in by the data that's coming from the interventions, as you can see to the right, feeding into a, a platform where that can be integrated or a multitude of platforms that are integrated but really moves then to segmentation of the population groups across the regions 
to try and identify what is my high risk population and what are the cohorts and how do we do that in terms of resource allocation, but then design the new models of care for those different population groups across, you know, all the different venues of care. But then when we look at the system level, aggregating all that and looking at a system level analysis to look at what the changes are in population health and care needs, what my implications for the system are for future demand as well, and what do we need to do in terms of regulation, policy, incentives and financial arrangements as, again, focus on what interventions are, are doing and focus on what we need to do um, moving to that outcome space value care model rather than a, a fee-for-service process task rewarded model as such. So in terms of what this looked like, it looks like a model where the person really whose needs and preference, they define what the requirements of the healthcare delivery system are. And then in terms of moving forward, that patient facing interface and the patient facing data actually moves through the enterprise, which then creates the one plan, has the one record and creates one plan with that one digital front door for the person to improve their experience, but then feeds into what the network needs creating that um, interoperability really as the core function, but also allowing for the population health management and planning and being successful in the delivery of um, health and plans to a cohort, but also to a network in terms of a region. And then moving into the aspect of supporting the health economy it's itself and what is emerging from the data intelligence to actually support the industries and the community itself. So really it can manage that supply, demand and utilisation in what is a current time and that what is emerging as well. You might think that this is a utopia and I'm talking about things that don't happen. However, I really wanted to point out some, some really good examples across the world where we've seen it happen. So moving back to that person specific information, Memorial Home in the US is a program of everyday well where they have a 24 seven virtual teams looking at the and looking through the information that comes in through that consumer device integration, but also consumer entered data and offer possibilities for video visits at any point in time and really coming back to their device patient specific care plans and they push those through the patient portals as well. And in Australia, we're starting to see some of the interest in patient portals. Um, Meredith mentioned the My Health Record of being that personally controlled, which was one of our first and, and um, gives patients ability. But in terms of what we're seeing in the rest of the network space, we're starting to see that patient portal conversation emerge. Whereas in the rest of the globe, that is actually something that comes with an electronic health record. When you go live, you go live with a clinical side and you go live with the consumers and patient side at the same time. But we're starting to see that more and more in Australia. In terms of a network as such, London and put out the London vision where they had the shared ambition to make London the world's healthiest global city as such. And to do that, they established that to deliver on the London vision, they established to the connectedness and the ability to connect records as well, the partnership, and they leveraged the integrated platforms to actually deliver care process models that allowed them to actually respond now in COVID. So all that work had been done and to push out care pathways related to COVID that was supported and, and were enabled by decision support within 24 hours and set up you know, surge hospitals very quickly as well within a weekend. NHS from, a, from a, um, an economy perspective, if we look at what they've done, they actually have, they cover 55 million lives and what they've done is integrate the whole of analytical products to actually come together to what is the performance and population health management dashboard to look at the right care at the right time, but also to look at what the emerging trends are as well. And if we look at another economy like Sweden, Sweden's aspiration really was to, to look through and start the other way around, if I should say. So their ambition really was to start promoting from a health prevention perspective and be proactive and strengthen primary care, close the care through that and find any unjustified differences in the outcomes and how any of those 
um, variability should be counteracted, but also fo focus on, on tackling health problems early and focus on activities that are across the sectors and promote those new forms of cooperation and community strengthening and empowerment of individuals and communities to really use technologies and digital tools as new models of care for those individual citizens to have their own plans, but also for the healthcare system in itself. So going back to the person and the people and the community, as we start to surface the clinical data it really and create intuitive patient-facing interfaces, we really empower the patients and establish that patient ownership and accountability to be active participants in their health delivery. We're also moving towards that cross-continuum coordination to really integrate all the systems that are leveraged by other providers, whether it's primary care, long-term care or acute care, and then focusing on that precision treatment support, which leverages that individual level data to provide clinical decision support and identify what is that personalized treatment plan, whether it's genomics or any other um, particular tool that increases the likelihood of the adherence and positive uh, patient outcomes as, as well. But then look at that comprehensive data suite that allows for business insight as well and supports all these new models of care to move towards value-based and outcomes, but also you is the, use it in the most appropriate and effective way as well. And then look at population health management tools to consider what external factors could be impacting the health and well-being of a particular region as such, and then driving sort of supply and demand care. But then having that single source of truth for all the data that impacts patient care and that generates that real-time data that supports that clinical decision-making and demand and capacity planning at all levels, whether it's at the individual health service or it's in a network or it's at a government level. And for that, we also need robust analytics capabilities to actually process and analyze and identify what data really has contributed to providers, patients and the environments in a timely manner that allows for high quality research and really is impactful to patient care. Bring to that what we've seen and support people in the self-management and remote monitoring solutions really are going to start to take more of a, a key action to support patients really move through and um, through the healthcare self-manage and generate alerts so that they can take proactive steps to prevent and really provide those communication mechanisms that are timely, are relevant and necessary at the time. So some key points to put into this as well, and this is what I'll, I'll finish well. What we need is, is we really need to support and what we've seen is the electronic health record as a really just a funda uh, fundamental piece of what is really a wider and a, what we want is a thriving ecosystem to support that really the concept of networks and open platforms are a key as well so we're moving to the platforms moving to open platforms but also making sure that we support and enable what is a healthy data value chain we support community connectivity, continue on the open platforms, but one important aspect as well is to actually have an enabled workforce that delivers and supports all of those as well in, in order to have an enabled community. Now, it's important to, to establish that we've talked about all the great things that can happen, but there's half of the world that's still offline. So we need to make sure that we don't, we have inclusive, um, method, you know, records and that we don't actually create a bigger digital divide and we know that there's some infrastructure that we need to work on as well from a technical perspective but also everything that is moving forward relies on supporting a community and being inclusive of all the different needs that are at different points in time as well. So with that Karen I think I'll stop now and hand over to Terry. Right thank you very much Monica. So our final speaker is Dr. Terry Hannan, who is a consultant physician in general internal medicine and a certified health informatics specialist and a Tasmanian. His contributions to digital health became in the, in the late 1980s with his leadership in the successful implementation of the Johns Hopkins Clinical Information System in Australia. 
the work, this work led to an invitation to assist in the development of a digital health project in Kenya in 1998 to manage the AIDS epidemic effect, affecting in order of 40 million people in the sub-Saharan Africa. This project has evolved into one of the largest open source digital health projects for low and middle income nations in the world, known as Open MRS. Dr. Hannan is an inaugural fellow of the International Academy of Health Sciences and Informatics. Thank you, Terry, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Karen. And as we did, this is a fantastic privilege to be able to play in this webinar. It's quite new for me, but very exciting. I'd like to take the audience back to 1989 in Canada when uh, eHealth had basically begun, but we had about 10 years experience and Francois Grini, who's now dead and one of the father, fathers of health information, technology and health, said his greatest concern is that the informaticians and clinicians of the future will become so seduced by the technology, they will forget about the patients. And at the same conference, you may have all heard of Professor Lawrence Weed, who told the story of a patient being discharged from a ward and concluded the presentation with the following uh, con uh, conclusions. Patients don't specialize. They and their families are in charge of all the relevant variables 24 hours a day. They must be given the right tools to work with and they are the most neglected source of better quality savings in the whole health system. And after all, they are highly motivated. And if nothing works in the long run anyway, they do not charge, they pay to help and there is one for every member of the population. So we talk a lot about EHRs and electronic health, but if you look at the literature, there is a study in 2005 that found there are over 51 unique definitions for e-health alone. So what are we actually trying to design and what are we trying to do? So I thought, mm, if I'm supposed to have some degree of knowledge about this, e-health area and electronic health records, I went back to some basics. And in the World Health Organization Charter, there's a fundamental that there is no healthcare without management and there is no management without information. Therefore, healthcare is an information management system. But added to that, in 1997, there was the uh, report the primary communication tool for healthcare is the medical record, regardless of whether it is manual or electronic. So out of this, I tried to fuse these two ideas together and came up with the medical record is in fact an information management tool for each person. And it records and tracks clinical decision-making and generates data and information sources that integrate with and create the need for data and information resources in the total healthcare system. And I'm going to show you some real examples of that. Oops. So I went looking and uh, saw out, uh, if I could find information on how many EMR vendors and EMR systems are in hospitals and uh, primary care. Only 2% of hospitals have a single vendor affiliated to medical practices. And the average hospital has 16 disparate EMR vendors to use in affiliated institutions. And in one regional hospital in Australia, there are over 100 differing non-interoperable digital health systems and no core EMR. We have the next one, here we go. And it's not only inpatients, it's outpatients as well. And as you can see here, the average hospital has affiliated providers using 16 different EMR vendors. And the average health system has affiliated 18 different EMR vendors. So this is a real quagmire of what is trying to be achieved. Now there, and here again, that was the outpatient. Here's the inpatient vendors. Acute EMR vendors average 82 disparate EMR vendors used by providers affiliated with their inpatient clients. So in many ways, we haven't got the act together and we have some clear evidence why this is harming the health system. Enrico Coyera, this is a summary of his paper, but it actually reflects also the conclusions by Bates and Singh and Koppel in their reviews of health information technology over the last 40 years. 
The current EHRs have been associated with decreased clinical satisfaction, increased documentation times, reduced quality and length of interaction with patients, new patient risk factors and safety, substantial investment costs for providers in terms of billions, health inflation, wastage and low quality. So what are some of the measures of these outcomes of current electronic health record systems? There's the phenomenon of underuse, of clinical resources underuse, overuse, inappropriate use, inappropriate variation, lack of uniform interoperability and standards, and lack of security. A recent study showed that cardiologists have only 15% compliance with established protocols of care. In a Canadian study, there were $2.4 billion worth of unnecessary blood tests costing $5 each. Inappropriate use with uh, diagnostic errors, really, really causing harm and costs. Classic is radiology and MRIs and CAT scans. And this all leads to inappropriate variation in care with poor quality outcomes. Now, if we all think we have a good health economy here, this is from the Australian Institute of Health Innovation at Macquarie University. 57% of Australians receive appropriate care, which means 43% receive inappropriate care. And 30% of this care delivers no benefits, costing the Australian economy $45 billion of wastage in annual health funding. So, Coera concludes that the current EHRs and our prior two speakers confirmed that we need to change how we look at this system. They tend to be thought of as a digital translation of paper-based record. And so the technology is there, but it's not doing what we want to do. It's causing us to lose the conversation with the patient and listening has been replaced by computation and they are dire need of reinvention, which I think that three of our speakers agree with. Now, I'm going to provide you with two examples. We have an aging population, and I think Meredith spoke about the polypharmacy. Whoops, let me go back, go back to Eleanor, please. Yeah. The polypharmacy and nursing home. So this is the population that we need to significantly understand or their carers have electronic technology to help their care. Now, Eleanor in this photograph is 89. Her son is the professor of computer science in the University of Colorado. And she says to him, Clayton, the internet is a corner I will not turn. There's no mail here. I want a scroll bar. So Clayton went to his colleague who generated this system. And this is 15 year old technology that the, when Eleanor turned on her computer, the mailbox opened, she had letters, she read them and replied. And in the last year of her life, she sent 2,500 emails. This is adaptation of the technology to the end user. Now, we talk about information management in hospitals. This is a random photograph in about 2000 at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, where we began the electronic health project. So here we, this is random. So we have bed block. This is a good day. There's normally four per bed. This is your Google resource or PubMed from Alabama, educating the doctors, the students and the nurses. And this record is the source of data and clinical management. For which patient? Is it an excellent data capture tool? Where are the resources like monitors, etc.? And this is where we knew there was a 14% prevalence of HIV and AIDS in the community. So what we did, we went to a small clinic out in the countryside where there's only one doctor as an administrator and the clinic was run by a pharmacist, nurses, aides and nurses. And we physically and metaphorically sat in the dirt for 18 months so that they appeared, the end users helped design the screens and inputs in Microsoft Access so that they could manage their patients. And a report on nearly 64,000 patients' visits generated at the touch of a button uh, formulated in Access produced this report, which changed the management of HIV in Africa, 40 million people. You can see there's a list of diagnoses, resource utilization, medications, et cetera, but what it showed there was no HIV or TB recorded. The Kenyan government up to this time wanted nothing to do with this philanthropic project. They now said this system had to be in every clinic in Kenya. No prior computer experience, poor electricity supplies, 
accessible only by four wheel drive, et cetera. And we have to go from 100,000 patients to 40 million patients. And out of that, using the Regan Strife medical record experience, Open MRS was built by Dr. Paul Biondich and Dr. Burke Memlin. Now, I'm just going to do a jump forward 20 years. This is where patient information affects the whole healthcare system. So out of this over the last 20 years, using the uh, background concept dictionary and other functions in the open source medical record, which is written in eight different languages, technology is now affordable. This is a cancer care clinic. The next reduction in malaria, patients who are now receiving their drugs for nothing because the system allowed funding for antiretrovirals produce high quality output from this originally barren land. And the food is distributed through the electronic record and what is left over creates a minor economy. The success of this project has led to the infrastructure. Remember the ward photograph we saw before? This is the result of the data and information from this electronic record or EHR system. Technology, clean wards. This is Professor Sylvester Cameo here. He was in, is in charge of the Elder at project, project and he needed, he was used to support the establishment of this system in another area of Kenya. They had over uh, unused uh, ship containers. So this is now a clinic or a pharmacy or a radiology. This is a photograph taken from the implementation of open MRS in the Ebola crisis. This is Daniel Kayiwa, a fourth year medical student who was the first patient we ever treated. He was about three days from death. He was given a year, a lifetime supply of antiretrovirals. And this is taken in January this year as he's sitting for his master's in public health in Indiana. But we had to treat 40 million of these. So out of this expansion of this open source medical record system where the system is owned by the people in the community, the system can be designed for the local community. The data is standardized. So collaboration is required. The system had to be scalable and sustainable, flexible for a whole different set of environments for not only medical care, prevention, uh, data in the village and rapid form design. Now in OpenMRS, the end user without any programming knowledge can create a, a data entry uh, form design system. The system creates data for high quality research. Originally it was web-based with intermittent connectivity, but now they the high use of mobile phone, uh, phones in developing nations means it can be directly uploaded to the cloud. The system had to be of low cost. The average income of a Kenyan is $400 Australian a year. Pfizer was originally asking $700 US a month for their medications. We now, out of the benefits of this system, they get their drugs free. But overall, which our two previous speakers have spoken about, the system won't be used if it's not clinically useful. So where have we got to? So this is 2000 figures from 2018 of the implementation of open MRS around the world. At that in 2018, there were over 3000 sites and 8.7 million active patients for all disease states. The data is used for the whole health system, direct care, prevention, education, resource allocation. And because of the nature of the adaptability of this system out of the CIL IEL laboratory in Colombia uh, managed by Professor Andy Carter, the dictionary was updated directly for the COVID epidemic. The system was invited to manage the uh, Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone. And out of that, they defined the concepts of using an open source medical record for all future epidemics. And so the open MRS and COVID-19 dictionary allowed countries to slow the transmission of the disease. And now more than 5,500 healthcare facilities and over 9 million patients are managed within this system around the world where the data is standardized, shareable across all electronic uh, information systems, is freely downloadable, can go onto a mobile device, uh, And so I'd like to conclude with uh, the thoughts of Enrico Coera, who's one of the, probably 
this most significant leader in the Australia in e-health, he, in his paper, The Dangerous Decade, rule one is that technical systems have social consequences. Whenever you put technology into a society, it changes it. Our two previous speakers spoke about um, dissemination in the community. There is a beautiful photograph that I use in other slides of two Kenyan women with their own medical records sharing it in the, when we printed it out for them. So they were sharing their knowledge about their diseases, they were sharing it with each other, and they took that knowledge back to the community to educate all those others in the community, which is no additional cost, but they are the best communicators. We don't design technology, we have to design socio-technical systems, and to design socio-technical systems, we must understand how people and technologies interact. And that's my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sherry. Um, so we've had a number of um, comments being posted on the, the, the Q&A section, um, and I've noticed my colleagues have been answering them, and we will, as I'm closing out, continue trying to type our responses to your questions, um, because unfortunately we I have run out of time uh, to be able to um, put these questions to our panellists. So what I've heard consistently today is that there is this need for the electronic health record to be person-centred and not organisational centred or focused. Electronic health records, they enable clinicians to be able to make safer care decisions, but they can also empower citizens to be able to have greater engagement in, in those care decisions. The EHR uh, needs to become a wider and thriver, plat thriving platform moving to open platforms, as we've heard from, from our presenters. And, and lastly, we need to be able to enable workforces to be able to have enabled communities as one of the strategies to be able to, re to reduce the digital divide. I'm sure you'll join me a bit silently in thanking our speakers, Professor Meredith Makem, Dr. Monica Trujillo, and Dr. Terry Hannon. This afternoon's talk will be available soon as a video and a podcast via the Islands of Ideas website now on your screens. The series continues with upcoming online public lectures and forums also shown on your screens. I would strongly encourage you to continue the discussion by registering for these talks. The university is looking forward to continuing the ideas, debate and discussion from and for Tasmania. Thank you for taking part in this event and goodbye. Thank you. Right.